I'm going to look more carefully at the theory that the universe has always existed in an infinite regress of causes, where each stage of the universe is caused by a prior stage. I'm interested in seeing whether an infinite regress could explain why the universe exists or why anything exists. In another video, I considered the infinite regress quickly. In this video, I want to look into the matter at much greater depth. So what's at stake? Well, it seems to me that the best explanation of existence is going to be in terms of some foundational element of reality, something that exists and it doesn't depend on anything else. In fact, it has self-existence. It exists just because it cannot not exist. It has a kind of robust grip on existence. But suppose there is no foundation of things. Each thing in reality just depends on something other. To help us to think about this, imagine an infinite stack of turtles. So it's turtles all the way down. Each turtle depends for its existence on another turtle. Now, intuitively, you might think, of course, just citing the causes of each turtle doesn't do anything to explain why there are those very turtles. Why not a stack of giraffes or pebbles or just nothing? However, in the history of philosophy, there have been some advanced questions and thoughts about the infinite regress, and it hasn't been so clear that we couldn't explain the total series by explaining each part of the series. And so I want to think about these things carefully. First, it helps to distinguish two related questions. First, why are there any turtles? Second, why are there those particular turtles? With respect to that first question, why are there any turtles? This is like the question, why does anything at all exist rather than nothing? There's a theory put forward by an excellent philosopher from Acadia University named Stephen Mateson. And he proposes a really interesting explanation of existence. He says, perhaps there's something rather than nothing because there are penguins. That's right, there's penguins and that's why there's something rather than nothing. Now you might think, well, that's, that's a little odd. I mean, how does that work? Doesn't the existence of penguins presuppose that there's something? Well, what Bateson is observing is that the existence of pengu penguins, they, they entail that there's something rather than nothing. In that sense, they do seem to explain why there's something because after all, given penguins and given any particular thing, it's mere existence guarantees that there's something rather than nothing. So I asked my kids about this. I asked my eight-year-old in particular, does a particular laptop explain why there are laptops rather than none? He thought about it. He said, no, it doesn't explain why there are some laptops rather than none. That's his intuition. Now, maybe he wasn't fully understanding the question. Or maybe he still has a kind of native intuition uncorrupted by philosophy. Well, whatever the case, it does seem that there's something right about Mason's theory. I mean, there's something right about the fact that each thing implies the existence of something rather than nothing. And so in that sense, I guess perhaps it does explain why there, there is something. However, there does seem to be still a further question, a deeper question, something left over. Consider again the turtles. We want to know why there are turtles. Should we say, well, each turtle explains why there are turtles at all, rather than just none? That doesn't seem quite right. I mean, consider the general category, turtle. It's not empty in this scenario. But why isn't it empty? Why are there members of the category turtle? To appeal to one of the members to explain why there are any members feels, well, it kind of feels circular. I mean, it doesn't seem to really answer that deeper question. Now, maybe, maybe you could appeal to a member of a category to explain why that category isn't empty because that member falls under a more fundamental category. For example, maybe, maybe each turtle in this series is a snapping turtle. And so the reason why there are turtles is because there are snapping turtles. So in that case, you could explain 
why the category is not empty in terms of the members, as long as you appeal to a more fundamental category that those members fall under. But then we can ask about that more fundamental category, the snapping turtles. Why are they in existence? Why is that category not empty? And it seems to me that we can take this all the way down to uh, any, any category. Any category is going to have its most fundamental instances, and we can wonder why, why that category isn't empty. Go back to existence. Why is the category of existence not empty? Why is there something rather than nothing? So while each thing may explain to some extent why there's something rather than nothing, in the sense that it entails that there be something, it may still seem that there's this deeper question left over that isn't yet answered. Well, let's go back again to that second question, the question about not why there are any turtles rather than none, but why are, there are those particular turtles? Why did they exist? I want to think in the rest of this video about that particular answer to the question of existence. There are turtles because each turtle is caused by another. Now, in the history of philosophy, there is this thought that by explaining each member in the series, you have thereby explained the whole series. I mean, this is quite reasonable. Just think about it. Each turtle is fully explained by another turtle. And so each turtle has a complete explanation. There's no turtle that is not explained. And then by explaining each turtle, haven't you thereby explained the whole? The whole is explained by its parts. The whole stack of turtles is explained by each turtle. And maybe this sounds weird that all the turtles are explained. We're only appealing to other turtles. But maybe the weirdness here just has to do with the weirdness of infinity. Infinity is weird. But if we're allowing an infinite regress, then it seems we could have an explanation for everything that we'd want to explain. Each turtle is explained, and the whole sequence is explained by the parts. In fact, this idea that the whole can be explained by the parts makes a lot of sense of various examples we can think of. Paul Edwards, a philosopher of the 20th century, proposed a famous example involving Eskimos. So imagine you encounter a group of Eskimos at some corner. And you ask them why they're there, why, why they're at that corner. And each Eskimo gives his story. I'm here because of this, this, this. Another Eskimo says, I'm here because of that and that. So they all have an explanation. Now that they've each given their explanation, you can add up those individual explanations. And now you have a total explanation for why they're all there. Edwards says, we wouldn't need any additional explanation for why they're all there, because by explaining why each one's there, we thereby explain why they're all there. And I think this example does indeed support the idea that you can explain the whole, the whole group of them, by explaining each part. The explanations of the parts do indeed constitute an explanation for the whole. So then in the infinite regress, if you have this infinite chain of turtles, you do explain why each turtle exists by another turtle, and you explain why they all exist in terms of those same turtles. But let's think about this a little more carefully. In the Eskimo example, the explanation for why those Eskimos are there is in terms of things other than those Eskimos being there. I mean, they're citing factors that run outside the thing you're explaining. We didn't say the Eskimos are there because they're there. Now that wouldn't be an explanation. That would be circular in a way that doesn't satisfy the question. So a circular explanation doesn't seem to work. But now look at the infinite regress. In the infinite regress of turtles, if we say those turtles are there just because of those same turtles, right? then isn't that circular in the same way as the circular Eskimo case? How could that work? Now you might think, look, in the, in the infinite sequence, you can't have a circle precisely because it's an infinite sequence. I mean, that's, that, that doesn't make sense. An infinite sequence has no first member, and an infinite sequence is not the same as a circular sequence. But this very question 
highlights the difference between explaining individuals and explaining a whole plurality. A whole plurality that explains itself is circular, whether that plurality is finite or infinite. So think about this. Imagine you've got two turtles, okay? Imagine that they exist because they exist. Well, that's circular. Imagine instead of two, it's three. Those three exist because those three exist. Well, that's circular. And it wouldn't help if those three existed because two of them existed. Citing a subset of them doesn't help. That's still circular. Same with five, 10, infinitely many. If you say those infinitely many turtles exist because those infinitely many turtles exist, well, that's circular. To further illustrate this problem of circular explanations, Consider the case of the infinite cannonball given by philosopher Alexander Proof. It's not the infinite size. It's not that the ball is infinite in size or infinitely old. Rather, this ball was launched a finite time, of, time ago, but each interval of time is infinitely divisible. For example, you can cut the time of its launch into two halves, with the first half being further divided into two halves, and the first half of those two halves being divided into two halves ad infinitum. So the thing to see about this cannonball scenario is that although each of its states is explained, all the states together don't explain why that cannonball was launched in the first place. We can see this by the problem of circular explanation. If we just appeal to the states of the cannonball to explain its states, then we don't have an explanation that runs outside of the thing to be explained. And this problem arises for any infinite regress. The regress can't by itself explain itself, assuming there's no underlying self-existent foundation, something that exists just because it cannot not exist. If each thing depends on another thing, then you can ask of those things, all of them together, what explains them? Let's think just a little more carefully about this inference, the inference from each thing is explained, so all of them are explained. I mean, it's tempting enough, if each thing is explained, aren't they all explained? But actually, this inference commits a kind of fallacy which is like the fallacy of composition, which is the fallacy of thinking that the whole has all of the features of its parts. Clearly, there are counter examples to that. Well, it's the same here. Imagine each turtle has an outside explanation in terms of another turtle. Should we say that all the turtles together have an outside explanation in terms of another turtle? Well, that doesn't make sense because there's nothing beyond all the turtles together. And so just because each has an explanation, it doesn't follow that they all together have an explanation. In fact, if they did, the explanation would have to be in terms of those same turtles. So again, it would be circular. Now, I'm taking this discussion to a kind of abstract and complex level of depth, but that's because the objections brought up are abstract and complex. And so we have to go deep in thinking about them. This technical analysis reveals, I think, that that initial intuition that the bottomless stack of turtles wouldn't explain why there are those turtles. Why the turtles? rather than pebbles or something else. But that intuition, that that basic sense is, is correct. In fact, upon further analysis, it's not only correct, we can show that if it were not correct, then you would have a circular explanation. Those turtles would be explained by those turtles. And that's something that's not just easy to see, I think. I don't think it was seen clearly by Hume. Hume was thinking in terms of each individual being explained, and then the whole being explained by its parts. But forget about the whole, just think about the parts. What explains them? If you cite those same parts or a subset of them, then you have a circular explanation, like the Eskimos being at the corner because they're at the corner. And that doesn't, that doesn't satisfy the question we're trying to answer. So why does this matter? Well, what I think is at stake here is the foundation theory. Foundation theory is that at the bottom of all things, the foundation of existence is something that exists, but not because it depends on something else. 
It exists just because of its nature. It cannot not exist, and it provides the ultimate ground for everything else. Now, what's interesting is that a foundation theory is compatible with an infinite regress. You could have an eternal universe. As long as that universe has a foundation, self-existent, independent reality that gives rise to everything else, perhaps at each moment of its existence, then we have an ultimate explanation for its existence. But sometimes the infinite regress theory is proposed as an alternative to the foundation theory. And what this analysis suggests is that that's actually a mistake. The infinite regress theory, whether it's true or false, doesn't provide an alternative explanation to the foundation theory because it really just doesn't provide any explanation. 